Hey, welcome once again to our Jonah series. We are in chapter two. Uh, remember chapter one was Jonah uh, and the storm. And we remember all that Jonah went through and how that uh, when he, the Lord gave him a word, he runs completely in the opposite direction, buys a ticket off a ship to head from Joppa to Tarshish. He's not going anywhere towards uh, Nineveh whatsoever. It's not in his heart and mind. So we talked a lot about that last week and I hope you enjoyed the studies we got in the word of God. Chapter two. I am praying that you've spent some time looking at this chapter, what, 10 verses, I believe, that you've spent some time praying over. This is a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful uh, word from a man who's broken before God, and you see him there, and how God moves in, in, in mercy and grace. In fact, this whole story is just this love story of God loving people. It starts with God I, I, God says, I even love the Gentiles. I want Nineveh to repent. And then he sends Jonah, whom he loves, and then Jonah doesn't want to do it. And so Jonah runs from God, but yet here's the love of God and drawing back Jonah. So, man, what a what a great, great passage of scripture for us to study as believers because even in our stupidity and ignorance at times when we reject what the Lord has for us and have a tendency to run all the way in the wrong direction yet God still just reaches out and loves us and calls us and convicts us and brings us back to himself loves us enough if necessary to send a storm and that's where we are Jonah we said Jonah chapter one was Jonah and the storm and now Jonah and the fish so John 1, 7, the Jonah 1.17 is that last verse. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of that fish for three days and three nights. So here he goes. They throw him into the ocean. Uh, he's, you know, that uh, he starts to drown. And then God just comes at the, uh, and as an act, not so much of punishment, but of preservation to keep him completely drowning. At that point, he swallows him up. Now, does Jonah drown there, or does he drown inside the well? There's really uh, several popular schools. Even among mainline theologians, there's uh, two different kind of ideas here. That one, that when Jonah went into the well, he ultimately died, and then God resurrected him. And thus, they say that's why Jesus makes reference and says, just as Jonah was in the well, just as he died, the Son of Man's going to die and be in the belly of the earth. You know, the Jonah's in that grave was the belly of the well. And there's several verses that people point to in, in the line of that. It says, I called out my stress in verse 2. He says, I called for help from the depth of Sheol. Uh, many people say that's just allegorical or kind of symbolic. Uh, but Sheol is Sheol, and he's in the only one way to get to Sheol, and that's to die. You say, uh, well, where do you stand? You know, again, this is not going to be anything that's going to send you to hell if you believe one way or the other on this. I just happen to believe that Jesus used Jonah's illustration because Jonah was raised from the dead inside that well, you know, that God raised him from the dead. And I believe this this prayer is from, from his time in Sheol. It was like, well, he's dead. Hey, do you not believe that once you die, you're still not going to be able to talk? Your soul is an eternal, you are an eternal being, all right? God doesn't cut your tongue out when you die. All right, because we read about people in hell speaking and, and people in Sheol speaking, people from, you know, wanting to be resurrected and is a the rich man of Lazarus story. You remember that story? So he said, I went, if you read the story, uh, death is in just engulfing him. And in its midst of all this, he's crying out to the Lord. So, uh, again, I'm sure you can discuss it some in your group today. Was Jonah alive or was he dead? And take up a position there. But I certainly don't want you to argue over it or get upset because somebody might have opinion or get upset with me because I actually believe that he died. All right. So it, whatever way it happened, it, the story the story still has the same relevance, I believe. But I think it carries a deeper relevance when Jesus is talking about Jonah and the resurrection. But ultimately, God brings this well along as, as, as a place where he preserves Jonah from the sea and puts him inside the well. And there it, he begins with this tremendous, this, this prayer, uh, the, the entire chapter, but the very last verse, again, it's a short chapter, it all deals with a, with a prayer. And we've talked about prayer other times in, 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 in teaching and preaching lessons and even in lift group pa in past. And I think I did a, one of the latter lift groups that I shared with you. We, we spoke on prayer and then shared the lesson with you. And then we had the, the study guide that I wrote for you on prayer. But when you break this prayer down in scripture, it is so biblical, it is so scriptural, it is filled with, it is filled with elements of thanksgiving, contrition, uh, repentance, rededication, recommitment to the Lord as he just pours out his heart to God. And you, then you see him come to this, this awesome place of just getting, giving, his, giving his heart and his mind back to the, to the Father completely. The first part y'all can talk about as a group a little bit will be the element of thanksgiving verses 2 through 6 and how, how, how important Thanksgiving is. In fact, 
uh, we can really tell many times in our relationship with our fathers how important Thanksgiving is. You know, there's two parts of prayer that most people spend most of their time with is probably petition, praying for my needs, and the other one is intercession, praying for other people. But I would think, honestly, not much of our prayer time is ought to be taken, it should be taken, is taken with that element of Thanksgiving with which he starts with, of just the heart of gratitude. There is so much in Scripture, in the Psalms, and even in the New Testament about entering to his courts with praise and thanksgiving, adoration. Remember, your relationship with God is just that. It is a relationship. We are in the family of God. I'm his child. He's my father. Now, I have children, and as a father, I know what that relationship is like. If all that relationship was just asking, for, it was about my children asking me for stuff for them or asking me for stuff for others, that children wouldn't make for a lot of relationship. My relationship and my children is, is spent time with, with loving each other and caring for each other and, and focusing on each other and knowing you know, the heart of each other and the, and the plans. and the, you know, so, so there's so much about our prayer life that should be focused on the, the aspect of it's about God. I, wanna, I have a relationship with God. I, I want to adore him. I want to talk to him, not just in petition, not just in intercession, but in gratitude and love and, and worship. Uh, I think it, when you examine this prayer and then take a moment of honesty to look at your own prayer life and see where you are at, yes, there, there's a there's so much clarity in his prayer. He's not asking for a lot of stuff. He's just really, I don't even think he's asking for a deliverance if you look real close to it. He's, you know, he just talks about uh, God and his mercy, and he talks about where he is and how he's been expelled, and how he's going to look back to God and all this and things and uh, where he's at. Uh, you know, where, where are we at in our prayer life? Where do we find ourselves? Uh, uh, I think one thing we should come out from this is that we just need to learn how to call on the Lord, not in our distress, yes, but also in, in just regular times, just to spend time with God. He does express his contrition. We'll talk about that in group in a little while, but verses 7 and 8. Uh, he's, he's aware and, and he's broken, and, and I think that sometimes... Uh, we get frustrated and we are hurt and we are suffering and we're alone perhaps, but sometimes we fail to come to the real place of brokenness with the Lord uh, where we just realize that we, can, we are absolutely helpless without him, that if there's nothing within me that's going to rescue me. There's nothing within me that's going to save me. It all has to be God. It all has to be an utter, utter understanding that I need God every day, every hour, every moment. There's a part of me that thinks, you know, I just need God sometimes or when things get rough or getting too bad. And I've really missed the context, well, of what I was talking about just a while ago of relationship. That he's my heavenly father and I'm his child. So contrition is a really important part. I think sometimes we're embarrassed or even more ashamed and we cry out, cry out for repentance. But man, taking it to that next level, you know, the Bible says a wounded spirit, who can bear? But God, you know, God, God takes that person of a broken and contrite heart and he delivers that person. And often we're not broken. We're just, we're, we're wounded and we're bruised and we're, we're afflicted. But we haven't come to the place of just, hey, it's time to let, let God have every way with me. And whatever, God, whatever way that is. And then he comes to that part of, of, of recommitment. He says, I'll sacrifice to you the voice of thanksgiving. That which I vowed I will pay. For, I will pay. He's coming back to the place of, of real repentance in his life to come back and say, hey, you call me. And I think this is what it really says, I'll pay what I vowed unto the Lord. And you'll find that in other places in, in, in Scripture. David said, I will pay my vows to the Lord. In other words, in, from Jonah's perspective, I'm a prophet of God. You call me. And that means to take your word and to share it with, ever, with whomever, wherever you've called me to do it. And I haven't done that. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been limiting you. I've been calculated when and where I would exercise that prophetic gift that you've given me. I haven't been honest and real. I've just built this little uh, altar, for, you know, and, and, and it, it's not worshiping you. It's really just worshiping this self-image I've made. That I'll worship God as long as he doesn't ask me to do this. I'll worship God as, as long as you don't have to do that or say that or go here or do that. And what that is, it's, it's not an idol, so to say, that he talks about here, but it is a mental image. It's a mental idol. It's something we built up in our minds. So I'm worshiping God, 
But if we have these restrictions, are we really worshiping God? I mean, if we put all these restrictions up, up, upon uh, where and how we we'll worship, then that, that's just idolatry. It's, it's, it's a mental graven image that we have built before the Lord. And so when Jonah's saying, I will repay my vows unto the Lord, I really believe he's saying, hey, God's called me to be a prophet, and I will be the prophet God's called me to be. Wherever he wants me to be the prophet, doing whatever he wants me to say, however he wants me to say it, I will repay my vows unto the Lord. You know, when we come to Christ, we, yeah, I don't know about you, I remember just coming to the Lord and just saying, Lord, here I am. I am a sinner. Please forgive me and cleanse me. And, uh, you know, I'll follow you, Jesus. <laughs> that's that's a that's a the point of absolute surrender in reality and that's what is expected presenting ourselves a living sacrifice but all too often far too many christians uh, say that and like joan in this situation they'll mean it so i think for us to hold that same attitude of coming back to the lord and saying i'll pay my vows i mean god i told you it was all or nothing so it's all i'll be what you call me to be i'll go where you call me to go and I do like the, the story how this, this verse, the whole thing, as I said, is a, is a prayer. Until you get that last verse, and it says, and the Lord, uh, let, me, let me look this up right quick. He says, uh, verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited up Jonah onto dry land. And I guess the prophet was much of a meal. So <laughs> the Lord prepares the fish, in one verse it says, and then the Lord commands the fish. So I don't have any trouble believing that. Again, the modern theologians may have an issue with it. God is God of creation. He's the God of all creation. If he can, if he can command the ravens to feed Elijah, as we talked about in our most recent series, then certainly he can command a fish to do whatever he wants that fish to do. And he can prepare that fish to do whatever he wants that fish to do. So I don't have a problem with that verse whatsoever. And the beauty of it is uh, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, they're not too far off the coastline of Joppa when they have this encounter, remember, with the, with the storm and with the well. In fact, when they hit the storm, it says that the, guy, the sailors are trying desperately to roll back to the land. So uh, uh, Jonah goes into the water, uh, I probably, I believe, near Joppa, uh, where he started his rebellion, and there the fish swallows him, and I believe takes him right back to that point where he was trying to get away from God it, and spits him back on the land there. And now Jonah's got a, and now the Lord says, you're going to go to Nineveh. He didn't take him up to the nearest coastline from Nineveh, doesn't, doesn't say that, does not say that, but I just believe it goes back to that principle of, you know, us being willing to go back to those places in our life where we miss God and get it right. And I think that's a good good point of a discussion for your group today. What what does it mean? Like in, in the book of Revelation, it says, "Repent from whence thou art fallen." We talked about that in recent sermon series as well. So, I'll let you reflect on on that. There's a lot to discuss here. Obviously, I pray you won't get so preoccupied with the fish. The preoccupation should be with how God works with people and how much God loves people. Uh, there is a miracle that takes place, but miracles happen. I mean, we get so freaked out. I mean, say, well, well, you know, the, what, if, if Jonah's dead, I mean, you've got to have to raise him to death. Well, so what? God can't do that? Yes, God can do that as well. So uh, leave, leave room for God to still be God. You don't have to put him in a box of, you know, to, to your limited thinking. Uh, God's a whole lot bigger than your mind or my mind. We can put ours together, and we still haven't gone very far in comparison to where God would have, where the mind of God is. So I pray that you'll take this study, and that when you finish this chapter 2 tonight, spend this week again on, on chapter 3 when you start looking at that and, and look what the Lord's saying, what the Lord's doing, and the same when we get into chapter 4. So be reading these verses repeatedly. It wouldn't hurt to have, by the time you finish this study, to have looked at the book of Jonah 10, 11, 12 times. Uh, I think God will really open your heart to really begin to see more than just the text on the page, but begin to see the beauty, just how beautiful you know, the story, it's, it, to me, it's like, the, it's like the, the story in the New Testament of just how beautiful the story of the prodigal son is. And what a great romance story. What a great love of God story. What a great recovery story. This is Jonah. I, I think he's the, the prodigal of the Old Testament. So, hey, enjoy the word. Enjoy your fellowship together tonight, today, or whenever, what time y'all are doing the study. And God bless you.